everyone, I'm Hannah Lloyd. And I'm Charlotte Gilfillan. Welcome to our podcast, Women in Wellies. Each episode, we will be inviting a guest to share their stories, experiences and lessons of working and living in rural Scotland. We want to get to know the real women behind the wellies and share them with you, our listeners. Hello, welcome to episode three of Women in Wellies. Today, we're joined by Sophie Handley of the Estates Office. Sophie, how are you? I'm good, thank you guys. How are you guys? Yeah, really good, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on and joining us. Sophie, do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So um, oh, going back, I'm a farmer's daughter from North Yorkshire. Um, I went, I studied at the Scottish Ag College in Aberdeen at Craveston Estate um, and got a, a degree in rural business management uh, with livestock agriculture. Um, I then moved out to the Isle of Lewis and worked on a community owned estate, which was a, a Highlands and Islands or oh, Highlands and Islands enterprise um, uh, placement, graduate placement. So I was out there for just over a year. Absolutely loved the Isle of Lewis. Um, still visit regularly um, and l- found out that that really was my passion working on estates. Um, Isle of Lewis was a little bit, a little bit far away from home and and sort of um, a little bit remote. Uh, so managed to find a job in Oban on the west coast of Scotland, um, doing basically working for a national company um that manage estates and did estate agency and all things like that um, and absolutely fell in love with argyle um, and the islands um, and it was just a little bit closer to home and uh the uh and glasgow and places like that so i didn't feel too remote um and then basically um Gosh, five, four or five years ago, I uh, left the national com- uh, company and uh, set up the estates office, uh, myself and my colleague, uh, Paul Nicholl. Um, and it's just grown and grown and grown. And I can't believe that we're four or five years into it. It's just been, it's just gone by so fast. What a, what a story, um, Sophie. Going back back to the beginning, we wanted to just ask you a little bit about life growing up on a farm. Like that's something that I think sure lots of our listeners will will relate to how did you find it how much did you get involved in the farm yeah i oh i love the farm it was it was quite a small one uh, we we did uh, bed and breakfast fattening pigs um so we worked with a larger larger pig farmer um and took their wieners and fattened them up to to, to the time that they were to go to slaughter um loved helping dad i i'm very much a daddy's girl um i was the one that was out helping him you know bed up and feed and and sort them all out um we had a little bit of land we had about 40 acres um which we we just did some some arable um uh, and it was great you know it was just it was i always think that i had quite a sheltered life but really you know driving tractors and going shooting with dad and you know all, all this sort of thing you know it was it was a different kind of upbringing than than the rest of my friends you know at school and um, they all thought i was weird <laughs> you know that i loved spending my weekend at home and not in town or, or or things like that um and then obviously we were involved with young farmers um and that was that became my f- main focus of friends um because you suddenly realize there's actually i'm not weird and i there's other people that are in the same boat and enjoy doing the same things um so no i loved it and if 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 the farm was bigger, I would probably still be down there farming. Um, but unfortunately, we we my dad my dad doesn't keep well, and we ended up sort of diversifying. So got rid of the pigs, and um, when my dad uh, got diagnosed, and um, and we started letting out the barns and things like that. So we sort of saw the diversification there. And then yeah, we uh, just got to the point where we were like, right, we need to sell it. Mum and dad sort of rattling around in this farmhouse, you know, wasn't doing them any good. Um, so it was better to to sell, which was awful and heartbreaking for everybody. But when I see mum and dad now, it's it's lovely that they're sort of settled in in the sort of smaller smaller house, which is perfect for them. Mm-hmm. Sounds like quite a journey with the farm, actually, and and it's something you don't really think about as somebody who grew up in the city. Do you know, like it doesn't 
I'm not saying it doesn't bother me if my parents sell the house I grew up in, but it's not my life. Do you know? It's just it's just a house. And um, and whereas for you, it's like you know, it's your whole parents' way of life. It's everything you were like brought up doing, which is really shapes who you are as as a person, um, and probably shapes a lot of what you've gone on gone on to do. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know, you you, you sort of like obviously I was quite young, but you 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 remember sort of listening to my mum and dad's land agents coming round and sitting around the table and sort of giving them advice and and things like that and you do you pick up on it and that was how I knew that that's what I wanted to do you know sitting around the kitchen table you know doing the Ajax form with my mum and dad's land agents and I was like actually this sounds pretty damn good you know um out and about you're not stuck in an office everything every day is different um and then sort of seeing you know going through the whole diversification getting rid of the pigs and and things like that like you know it was it was a risk but it was a risk that we had to take and luckily it paid off sounds like risks are a common thread i'm really interested to hear a bit more about the story of you opening the estates office because Mm -hmm. In my mind, it's really inspiring. And Sophie, you know that I thought you were a total hero. <laughs> and, you know, you you qualified, you got your MRICS mm-hmm. in 2017, and then in 2018 opened the estate office. And it was a big, bold move. There's no Huge. two ways about it. Mm-hmm. Um, it took, you know, it took a lot of courage, um, I think, to do that, certainly from an outsider's perspective. But, you know, tell us tell us more what it was like to to take that leap, if you like. Do you know, when I look back on it, I'm just like, how did I have the nerve to do that? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was it was crazy, but it was it was really weird. Um, I, I I had absolutely no plans, no plans to go out on my own to set up the estates office. And I, and it was like Easter time and a couple of clients had sort of said, you know, or oh, um, I, you, you know, how, how's work going? You're busy. Oh, absolutely. Do you enjoy working for the national company? Absolutely. You know, being the good employee that I was, you know, um, and they were just like, oh, well, just to let you know, if you were ever to think about going out on your own, we we would come with you and I was just like oh if that was just one client I could have maybe been just like yeah I can't survive on one client sort of thing you know but there was a couple and um and I think they'd all sort of obviously been talking um but then I kind of put it back into the back of my mind and I, I was like no I'm only a year qualified like can't do this um and I went back into the office and I, I spoke to to Paul, who has basically been my mentor through my training. And we've got a really, really s- special <laughs> relationship. Um, and I sort of said, you know, oh, th- these clients have sort of said this and I found it a bit weird. And um, and Paul was just like, well, if you do it, I'm 100 percent behind you sort of thing, you know, support, whatever um and I was just like no no I'm still nothing still nothing and then a couple of things happened and I was just like maybe I should start thinking about it and it all all of a very very quickly (laughs) sort of snowballed and all of a sudden we had the estates office I handed in my notice and I mentioned to other clients you know um I was leaving um you know I am going to set up the estates office um and had no idea i the estates office would become so popular but i think looking back on it is that what what i do it's so personal you do everything from buying toilet roll to looking after the insurance to the banking to accounts it's so personal what you what you know about the clients you know you're in their houses you're looking after their biggest assets you know, um, so I think because I'd obviously worked with them for four or five years, they obviously felt that they could trust me. They've obviously got new Paul for a lot longer than they know me. So they knew that we had the experience there. Um, and I, I think I think that sort of won them over, you know, and I didn't have to chase. That was the thing, you know, because we had that relationship with them, they they came happily um and it's just gone from success to success it's the personal relationship that basically builds the business and as you say you know you're you're so ingratiated into your clients lives because you manage such a huge part of their lives and it is quite diverse 
but it's the relationship building that really makes it and people will come to you clients will come to you because of who you are not necessarily because of who you work for yeah no absolutely and like I never imagined would be you know where we are now sort of you know five years down the line I I never expected it you know I thought oh you know we can survive with sort of three four clients you know um and yeah it's it's mad it's absolutely mad but I I honestly I wouldn't change anything because you've gone through quite a period of growth as well haven't you yeah we've grown every year so we've taken on members of staff every single year so that might have just been the bookkeeper a property manager and um, office manager you know we, we have grown every year because the client base has grown you know we've we've taken on more clients or what we do for clients has expanded um because where maybe when we're working for the national company we might have been restricted we're, we're now not really restricted in what, what we can offer. And our role has sort of expanded and um, we do everything from sort of filling the fridge to for, I've got a couple of clients who just want to turn up at their house and it'd be perfect and ready to use and they don't need to leave it for the weekend or the week. So we fill the fridge to, you know, full on estate management, looking after staff and everything. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, the the company has grown every year what are your plans going forward then (laughs) good question (laughs) um yeah so paul paul and i actually sat down um about sort of five six months ago and sort of we're very comfortable you know at the moment we've got a really good team um and we're comfortable it's busy but it's not it's now because we've got the team in place it's not ridiculously busy um and we were like what do we do are we just going to stay at this same level or are we just going to go out there and see see what happens and we went out there and we saw what happens and we got two new estates you know so there's definitely there's definitely more growth there um how much growth i want i'm not sure (laughs) because i think the more, the more you grow and it's going back to being that sort of that personal um relationship that you have with the client is that obviously the bigger you grow the the less time you're able to devote to those clients um so i think there will become a point where we're like no this is it you know um or until we can get more until until there's another me maybe i don't know <laughs> but that could sort of take that um I suppose that face-to-face contact with the clients more off me. Um, So yeah, so we'll see. But I think the next few years are going to be very exciting. No, they sound it and some great plans, definitely. And there is just so much scope for growth at the moment. But um, yeah, I appreciate what you say about not wanting to compromise that relationship with your clients, that really close relationship you have with your clients as well. One thing that, you know, is very clear is your uh, kind of interest in all sorts of things, you know, country sports related. Um, do you want to just tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I think from sort of growing up on the farm, you know, my dad was always sort of shooting pigeons and going off to sort of other farm shoots and things like that. So I've always sort of been brought up around shooting and fishing and, and things. But it's only been really probably in the last four year, three, four years where I've really got into my shooting. Um, and that's more sort of like clays and um during the summer and then sort of birds so pheasants uh woodcock uh partridges and things like that during during the season um so yeah it's it's i love it (laughs) it's awful to say but um i love it um and then it was fantastic that i um I, a, a friend of mine who works on one of the estates um, invited me to go stalking uh, in the rut last year. So I managed to get my first stag, which I was just, it was just amazing. The whole experience, just to see how, like, I've always thought, you know, deer and stags are just so magical and just majestic. Uh, but to see them just in you know you drive you 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 know you go through Glencoe and you see them on the side of the road but to basically be the only person or the only couple of people within a few mile radius and these stags is just amazing and I've got so much 
so much time for for stalkers and um and what they do in sort of managing in managing herds and um the whole experience was amazing from the actual stalk to um you know dealing with the carcass and, and things like that was just was just so interesting um so yes yeah, so that was amazing end of the year um and i really want to get into fishing um i used to do it a lot with my dad but and i think it's just such an old man sort of thing and i just love to sort of rock up and just you know be it you know be a fisherman <laughs> a fisherwoman i'd love to i'd love to give it a bit more of a go so yeah so i'm part of um i'm part of uh, a group of women called the country girls uk who are sort of national um national club um and they sort of put on a lot of a lot of the shooting shooting sort of um days for, uh, um through throughout the year with clays and clays and then sort of bird days um, and they're starting to do more like they do polo days and um for the horsey lot and and they're starting to do more some fishing so I'm definitely booking myself onto them <laughs> i think you just want that time sophie of quiet co- contemplation <laughs> it's so busy that you just need that like that space sophie i can't believe we've got this far and there has been no mention of either of your uh four-legged companions <laughs> tell us <laughs> tell us about george and ian george and ian oh um so george is my black lab um he's 11 doesn't act like it he's still still able to sort of walk the hills and and um and everything and show ian what to do ian is uh my golden retriever he's seven months old and absolutely mad um <laughs> so he's a bundle of energy um and often i catch george looking at me thinking and i know he's thinking why did you bring him into our house <laughs> you know, when he's staring around um so yeah but they 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 come george has always been well i was very lucky that um the previous company i worked for allowed me to take george into the office um and he became quite famous in urban because the office had um sort of a really big sort of shop front George used to just sit in the windows and people passing by you know would come in and just like can we talk talk to the dog (laughs) so it was amazing um unfortunately our office now doesn't have um street access but um uh so he can't he can't look out but um they still do come to the office with me and it's fab taking them around the estates like all the estates workers and and uh, staff and and even clients you know it's just like oh have you got the dogs with you and there's been times when i've gone back to back to the truck and the truck's been what the back door's been wide open and i'm like oh my goodness where are the dogs and the gamekeeper is just taking them for a run with his dogs you know (laughs) and it's just it's fab it's it's great they're constant companions why is ian called ian (laughs) (laughs) This is the most, this is, apart from, because he's not, a, he's not, when you think of a golden retriever, you think of like the white fluffy, you know, beautiful dogs. He's not that. He's a very traditional golden retriever. So he's really dark and, and um, not as fluffy. He's more curly. Um, so apart from what breed is he? Is he a long haired red fox lab? Um, uh, and why is he called Ian? Those are the two top questions. Um <laughs> Oh, whether to tell you the truth or not. Um, <laughs> um, I just, I think George was called George because I just love the name. And um, I, like, I'm not one that I don't think I'll ever have children. And I always thought, oh, George is like my son's name. So George became my son, George. Um, and George and Ian just sound like two old men just sitting around chilling, you know, and I love that. Um, also, I'm I'm slightly obsessed with Outlander. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have watched it, you know, JP. Oh, Frank, yes. Yeah. Um, and I love young Ian. Oh, he's amazing. <laughs> I just love, I just love him. <laughs> so Ian gets called young Ian. <laughs> so, yeah i just i could just picture you on a shoot day you know dogs out and about and you're like roaring ian across the shoot you know, and <laughs> the chances are there'll be the client there called ian or something like that. 
<laughs> but yeah, yeah. So um, it's Outlander, Outlander, really. <laughs> So I think we've we've probably um kind of covered off some of some of my next question um already and what we've talked about. But Sophie, what inspires you to kind of do what you do what you do? What inspires me? Um I think I've always had um I've always had a, obviously a passion for for rural living and rural life. Um obviously been growing up on a farm. Um I <laughs> as as a as a child my mum I think she thought she was dragging dragging us around country houses and 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 things like that but I loved it I love going I look I think it's it must be I must be really nosy because I just love exploring new places and new properties and um seeing how people live and and things like that I totally can totally totally relate I am I think I probably behaved like I was being dragged around castles and country houses <laughs> growing up. Uh, National Trust, Historic Scotland, English Heritage, name them all. Do you know? Like, but now I won't be without my life membership cards because I absolutely love going and. That's it, exactly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's you know, even it's just like you know, how many times have I been to Edinburgh Castle? Still love it. Still love it. Yeah. Stirling Castle. You know, all of these places where you know you can go and have a good nosy and you see something different every time and like it's the same with clients properties what whatever size you know not just talking about castles or farmhouses but the cottages and things you know mm-hmm. like we've recently done up a cottage and um we were stripping out the wallpaper and you saw the wallpaper of years gone by and it was just like it was amazing like i loved it mm-hmm. um just simple things like that just yeah. bring joy to I me <laughs> i can't remember which property it is but I think it's one of the like old cottages up in the Highlands somewhere and they've got like all they've taken the wallpaper back like in layers but they've left it so that you can see kind of all, all the wallpaper over the years That's I'm sure amazing. it's a national trust one but it's so cool because you can see that history and yeah. even like how tastes and fashions and and all of that have changed you know whereas like here Absolutely. in my house we were talking about wallpaper earlier I'm like stripping it right back to nothing so there's no history but it's like starting that history again isn't it like starting the, mm. giving people the background to put the layers the layers back on so if we're just looking then to challenges and things, you've obviously had some fairly major challenges that you've shared with us already about selling the farm, about, you know, creating the estates office and building that business and the growth. Are there any other challenges that you faced and how did you overcome these? Um, I think I think there's, there's always challenges, you know, and um, I think I've sort of grown to be quicker at solving those challenges whether it's just you know um it doesn't happen so much now that I'm older but when I was younger you know you'd you'd turn up to a a client's house or or maybe it's just like ad hoc advice or evaluation or something like that and you know the, the 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 client sees a young 20 something woman female and they're just like well hold on do you do you do you know what you're talking about do you do you have enough you know how can you provide me with advice you know um and it's just it is it's just it's just showing them and you know the amount of people that sort of say oh we've heard such good things about you about the estates office um from other people and i think words of mouth is a huge thing um, and just show, showing them that you do know you do know your stuff or you know somebody that does that can help if it's not in your remit um and i think just how one of the i think one of the biggest challenges is how people speak to you um and this and the one the one story that sort of comes to mind is actually from a member of staff where you know i'm a couple of years older than his daughter but the way that he spoke to me, he kind of wanted to go, well, hold on, how would you like it if a man spoke to your daughter the way you're speaking to me? You know, because he was, he was totally out of order. Um, so it's it's that, it's 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 the first it's the first opinion that people have of you of being a youngish female in what is still quite a male dominated industry, you know. Um uh so i th- i think that's probably the biggest challenge but i would never say that i i wouldn't say that i've ever been discriminated because i am a female but i think we've kind of got a little bit more to prove to them 
we've kind of got to prove it a little bit more. Um, where I think because or everybody thinks of it as an estate factor, or a, you know, a man with a moustache with a tweed coat, so a tweed jacket, you know, um, that's not me. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but your clients come to you for a reason because you do a very good job and you've built an entire reputation around that in a very, very short space of time as well. Um, so these traditional... Um, ideas of what a factor should be or what a land agent should be um, I think they're being challenged all the time and I think somebody in your position um, is really kind of helping with that because you you know you're quite prominent now having you know being having your own business and running your own business and running your own successful business um, and I think that's you know that's that's amazing yeah no absolutely and um I do I do think it's one of those industries where we're, we're seeing more females coming into it which is great um so yeah definitely if I can help in any way I will <laughs> I think you've definitely blazed a trail for a lot of people Sophie it's excellent <laughs> it's also, that's also the purpose of this you know it's why we want to do this podcast in the first place because you know sharing stories like like yours Sophie is inspiring for for others who are maybe considering coming into the rural sector or want to know more or even just want to hear you know from role models um within the sector who they maybe don't know about um don't know about already so i think that's like a huge part of of this whole this whole thing <laughs> absolutely and if 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 i can if i can get somebody interested or you know answer any questions to help them sort of focus in on that if this is the right career for them i'm all for it definitely so um we end all our podcast episodes by asking um, the same question, which is what one piece of advice would you give to the next generation of rural women in Scotland? That's such a good question. Um, I, th I think, I think, yeah, I think it's something that I wish I did uh, more earlier on in my, in my career. And that's just, if, if you believe in something and you've got something to say, stand up and say it, don't think that you're going to be judged. Don't think that it's the wrong thing to say. It's your, it's going to, you know, it might be your opinion. It might be, you know, some advice, whatever it is, have, have the guts to stand up and, and say it or, you know, yeah, I think that's the, the only thing, because I think, I think there's so many, I, I think as, as a female sort of growing up in the industry, um, I I think in a way I kind of shied away from being I suppose at the front because I thought oh well I'm young I don't know stuff um and and things like that um where at the end of the day you, the clients they want your opinion on things you know is is this the right business model is this the right diversification to go down is, is this the right thing to do is this the right member of staff to hire you know so you're giving your opinion and I just think that more women should stand up and say what they actually think and and um, and not shy away from it. Is there anything in particular that you've done, Sophie, to help develop your confidence? Um, it's really weird. I was I was speaking to a friend the other day and I think I think it was Beyonce. Um, who, <laughs> <laughs> not just her name in, you know. I think she always said that she has like, uh like a second per, like persona sasha, sasha fierce. fierce sasha yeah. fierce yeah when she's on stage she becomes sasha fierce and i think in a way i do something very similar with work where i think privately like i'm very i'm very like i feel like i'm quite like i'm like very out like i am outgoing and i am i like i am loud but i love my own quality personal space and time and, and things like that i love just being at home with the dogs and um, walking up hills with the dogs i love that and then at work i am i'm this boss bitch you know i don't know if I'm <laughs> maybe you know um and i can make decisions like that and i think I've basically created this second person, the second persona, mm -hmm. um, who acts confident and and you know can walk into a meeting and and or run a meeting or or run a you know whatever. Um, but at home, I still feel like I'm this shy 
farmer's daughter, you know, um, and, and, and that sort of goes back to to setting up my own business. When I when I sit back and think, how did I have the balls to do that? you know, mm -hmm. but I did it. And I think doing that has given me so much more confidence um, because it does every, every day I step out of my comfort zone and it pushes me that little bit more further. Um, so yeah. Which is absolutely amazing. And I think I'm like a very outgoing person as well, but I definitely need my time at home chilling out to recharge all that outgoingness, to recharge being the, you know, being what the, the thing that people see, the persona that people see externally you need that time to kind of recharge it but and growth definitely happens out of your comfort zone yeah my sister's very outgoing and loves being surrounded by friends and, and things like that and hosting like friends at, at home and things um and like I go to them you know when I'm back down in Yorkshire and um and then she can almost see like my social clock <laughs> I would say <laughs> my social limit beach its peak and then she's like you can go home if you want. <laughs> it's just like, it's so I can take and then I'm done. <laughs> I think there's a lot in there that a lot of people will, a lot of people will relate to in, in every way, whether you're an extrovert or an introvert, you can relate to those, that social battery, needing time to recharge, but also kind of pushing yourself out your comfort zone to, to achieve, to achieve amazing things. Yeah. Yeah, and oh gosh, there's that quote. It's just like you know, um, oh, I'll have to find it for you. But it's like amazing things never happen from comfort zones or something like mm -hmm. that, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's true, you know, you step out of your comfort zone and some amazing things can happen. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Absolutely. you're a testament to that, Sophie. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely feel that. So Sophie, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your stories, experiences and lessons. It's been lovely to have you with us. No, thank you so much for inviting me on. It's been it's been great to catch up and um and just sort of share my experiences with you all. If you would like to connect with Sophie on social media, you will find details in the show notes below. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, follow us on Instagram at Women and Wellies Podcast to stay up to date with all the latest news. And you can email us with any questions on womeninwelliespodcast at gmail.com and we'd love it if you could leave us a review and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next time.